you want to move on to um, public comment? Um, I think we're close enough at at uh, eight twenty seven that I, I believe we can get started on this. We have a lot of comment today, um, and of course we're open to receiving uh, public comment in writing also. Um, but these will these will be in person um, using technology here because of the art sign up. We're then limiting comments to two minutes. And again, uh, more comment can be submitted. Uh, Lorraine, you're the timekeeper on this. Uh, we're gonna start off with Laurel Bitzer with Lori Voldemar on deck. And I'll just keep calling out who's on deck. So, um, Laurel, are you ready? And if I, if I say your name wrong, please restate your name uh, before you speak. Is Laurel ready? I don't see her name yet. Okay, um, Lori Volmar, are, are you are you here with uh, yes. Andrew Mont on deck? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, so you can be involved in this. I am a former PTA president in California from a Title I school in Orange County. Um, I sent my children there. Most of my most of the neighborhood um, kind of falsified records to not go to that school. I did not want to lie, and I sent my six to school. It was nine percent. Right now it's nine percent Caucasian. Um, I really got involved in the school. I became a teacher, and uh, the school I had a, a kind of a funding to go to the Sacramento uh, Hospital. So I really believe in intercultural um, learning, and my kids did really well at that school. I had great teachers. Um, they they attended schools that were kind of polar opposite. They went to BYU or the University of Utah, and then they had the other two go to UC Berkeley and Harvard for exam degrees. I'm really concerned about the critical race theory that is you know, trying to be implemented in our schools. Uh, I'm still kind of currently involved in PTA here in Utah. I do the reflections and the thread. I really um, enjoyed learning about Natalie Klein and all of her work that she has done, and I follow her, and I think she's a great advocate. Um, I, I, growing up in California, I saw the Black community watch really is not that far from Orange County. And we have, I just feel like we strayed from the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King and creating this, a movement without violence. And I love his essays, which he I think that, so the point I want to make is that we need to, in our education, let's look at ourselves as equal. And we, yes, we have a horrific past the slavery, but uh, the critical race, critical racialization of it, and I don't feel well, still as right. That's time. That's fine. Okay. Well, that's mine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we'll have uh, Andrew Mont and uh, Donnell Pons on deck. Good morning, sir. And um, just to correct pronunciation, it's Andrew Mount. Thanks, all right, I'll begin. Yeah, you're um, good. Great, thanks. Uh, good morning, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a resident of Park City and I'm highly concerned with the propagation of so-called anti-racism, Lori called it critical race theory in schools across Utah. Racial inequities need to be addressed but not by teaching our children to view themselves, each other and our institutions first and foremost through the prism of race. Such a worldview exacerbates racial division rather than ending it. Um, and as a graduate of New York University Tisch School of the Arts, you should know, I experienced it firsthand. White students and black students were routinely segregated into affinity groups where white students were taught that we were oppressors and black students were taught that they were helpless victims of the system. Those of us bold enough to have meaningful 
honest discussions across racial lines expressed mutual frustration at how our identities have been reduced to our membership in certain racial groups. An opinion that was expressly discouraged by administrators and faculty during our school-wide diversity meetings. White students who spoke up were told to stop centering white voices and black students who opposed the ideological narrative were told that their opinions were illegitimate because they had internalized their oppression. In other words, these self-proclaimed anti-racists had weaponized race to silence dissent. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, the toxic ideology I described may seem foreign, but it isn't. It's here masquerading as virtue hiding behind words like diversity, equity, and inclusion, in terms like social justice, anti-bias training, and anti-racism. It's a facade, one I've seen before. It's neo-racism and neo-segregation hidden in plain sight. I implore you, when you come across it, reject it outright. Our kids are so much more than the color of their skin, and we should teach them that. Thank you for your time and for considering what I've said. Um, thank you. Um, next, we'll have um, Donna L. Pons and then Bruce Smith. You're on deck. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to address the board. As I've been watching the board meetings through Zoom, I've been impressed by the public comments and board responses regarding equity training for educators. Clearly, there are many opinions surrounding the types of training that would be appropriate for Utah educators. As I've reflected upon my years as an educator, parent, community activist, and tutor, among many other roles, I've been struck by how much I've learned by working with people in communities that are vastly different from my own. I am an excellent reader and very competent writer. However, I spend the majority of my day working with people who struggle to read and write. Although my lived experience is far removed from that of my students, many of them consider me the only person who truly understands them. I didn't become this person overnight. I became my students' best advocate and ally through years of learning. In fact, my journey of understanding began on my honeymoon when my husband of two days struggled to read a book. We had dated and married without my knowing that he couldn't really read. I knew he had been on the Dean's List at the University of Utah. I knew he was engaging, driven, adventurous, interesting, and curious, but I didn't know for him reading was slow, error prone, and fruitless. Had I not been raised by an educator who led by example that learning is a lifelong pursuit and that we should constantly be looking for information that either improved our current understanding or changed it altogether, I might not have had the confidence to, current, to tell my husband that reading seemed difficult for him and then ask him to tell me about the experience. Once he revealed his lifelong struggle with reading, I was determined to help him. It has taken two master's degrees, countless certifications in reading methods, attendance at reading conferences from one end of the country to the other, and endless years of researching to help my husband become a confident reader and writer. He now reads and writes better than he ever dreamed he could, but it hasn't been an easy journey. We learned many things about dyslexia. We learned about the struggle to read. We became educated about dyslexia, and we've been engaged in learning more and supporting others ever since. Because once we knew better, we wanted to do better. And we wanted to do better for everyone who was still struggling like my husband. And that's the other benefit from learning, empathy. As I discovered that dyslexia is heritable, brain-based, it's something you never outgrow. It's the number one reason why you'll struggle to read. I learned also about the evidence that we can teach people to read, anyone to read with the science of learning and the science of reading. And this learning led to understanding, understanding of people and help. So as we continue to face challenges as a community, I urge the board to search for understanding, engage in opportunities to learn more regarding equity, including developing your own equity literacy as board members. This is the only way to make meaningful change. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, next we'll have Bruce Smith with uh, Charles Cunningham on deck. Uh, Bruce. Good, good morning, I'm Bruce Smith, an active substitute teacher in the Alpine School District. Thank you for the opportunity to address the topic of critical race theory, also known as CRT, and hidden by the mask marketed as equity, which implementation I understand is well underway to be institutionalized in Utah public schools statewide. I share these comments as a white man and educator who enjoyed correspondence with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who raised my family of eight children in Montgomery, Alabama, who crossed the notorious Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma more times than Jesse Jackson ever thought of, and who worked with original black civil rights activists from Montgomery and Selma, Alabama 
to advance the cause of racial justice. I know something about racial facts and the racial theory and equity. The sacred duty of any school board of education is to serve the children, to ensure and enhance the maximum educational experience for these kids. A salient priority within that duty is to ensure the children are taught how to think, not what to think. This is not accomplished by the imposition of some subjective, highly suspicious theory over objective established fact. CRT is not fact. CRT is a theory and a lie wrapped in the hijacked skin of equity, which is nothing more than raw, ugly, systemic racism on steroids, driven by a sinister dark agenda designed to entice innocent children into the slough of Marxism. Do not doubt me. The evidence is voluminous and incontrovertible. I offer it to anyone who is not afraid of the truth, and there is so much more to share. Please do not sacrifice the future of these great kids on the altar of the perverse failed political theory called equity. Dr. King had a dream and he taught us all, and it was not a dream about equity. His dream was that my brown grandchildren were born with what it takes to thrive and succeed and achieve because of their God-given character and potential and not because they were victims due to their skin tone needing rescue from the state. Thank you for these couple of minutes allowing me an opportunity to protect all of my 11 grandchildren, white and brown, from the crippling and racist chains of equity. Thank you. Next, we'll have Charles Cunningham with Jefferson Shoup on deck. On deck. Charles, are you with us? You're muted. I think you're still muted. Can you hear me, Neil? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Charles Cunningham. I've lived in Park City for 19 years. I have four children, all went through the uh, public schools in Park City. I'm a retired attorney, big believer in public education. I served on the Park City School Board for six years. As you know, this board is going to be faced with the issue of critical race theory, either as part of curriculum or teacher and administrator training or both. CRT is viewed by a large increasing segment of Utah population, especially parents, as insidious, divisive, and very damaging to children and students. Once CRT is understood by the Utah population, the vast majority will reject it. There's no question about that. <clears throat> you have your own views and may well disagree, but what I want to address, and I don't think any of you can honestly disagree, is that if CRT is permitted in Utah public schools, either via curriculum or teacher training or both, it will create a firestorm among parents in the Utah public that will be very, very destructive to public education in the state, the likes of which have never been seen since I've lived here. In addition, the huge public outcry and the intense acrimony that will ne inevitably result, large segments of the Utah population, especially parents, will lose faith in Utah public education. The result will be a dramatic ex expansion in homeschooling, charter schools, and private schools, and sadly, a drive to cut funding for public education. That will happen like night follows day. The impact will be tumultuous, very destructive, and very hard to repair. It will be horrible for public education in the state. One more point, a very important point. CRT, if implemented in any form, will certainly lead to the direct involvement by the legislature in curriculum. Once that happens, your independence as a board and that of local school boards will be largely and perhaps permanently compromised. There's simply no doubt that the legislature will react to the public outcry and involve itself directly in curriculum a development that is already well underway in many states, including Idaho. In conclusion, I urge you to carefully consider the dramatic and deleterious impact on our public schools and on the public perception of this board in public education if you sanction the introduction of CRT in our schools, either through curriculum or teacher training. Thank you very much. Okay, next we'll have uh, Jefferson Shoup and then I believe Laurel Pitzer is now with us. So Jefferson. 
Um, Chair Huntsman, Jefferson sent me an email that he will be unable to make it today. Okay, so let's go to Laurel Pitzer and then Ellen. Uh, Neil, you're, you're on deck. Laurel, Laurel. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, I'm a parent of the Murray School District and I've been a volunteer for uh, over 20 years now in all the schools that my children have gone to. And recently we've had a major um, problem with critical race theory coming into our school district. And it has been very eye-opening to see um, how this has evolved. I think initially it has been brought in through our universities and colleges and, and now it's starting to come down through our um, high schools and junior highs and elementary schools. And I believe that this is um, going to be such a destructive theory if we teach it to our students. It just teaches people to look at the color of their skin and determine what someone's like from that. And um, I believe that we have all been taught to look at people for the content of their character and not just by the color of their skin. And this is trying to help us reverse engineer that and try to teach kids at a young age that um, their character is not important and that people can choose to be victims or oppressors. And um, we need to teach our students how to be responsible for their lives and to be um, to be active in their learning and to learn how to be critical thinkers. Um, I just really hope that our, our Utah State School Board can stand up and see critical race theory for what it is, that it is trying to really divide our communities and our families and our schools and to be um, very destructive to the education process. And I hope that you can stand up against it. Um, and I'll close there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next we'll have uh, Ellen uh, Neal with Matt Chang on deck. Ellen, are Thank you with me? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have been a teacher my whole adult life. I am now a university professor, teacher, educator, and researcher. I've lived and taught in San Francisco, Chicago, where a majority of my students and most of my neighbors were black, and Hong Kong before moving to Utah where my children attended middle and high school. I know that the board is considering diversity and equity training. I listened to the last session where parents and educators shared important stories and experiences. I agree with them that we want every student to feel valued. I also agree that it is important to have discussions about race, but I disagree with the way that many of them want to frame those discussions according to critical race theory. My thinking is more in line with well-known and well-respected black scholars like Harvard educated Thomas Sowell and Princeton educated Carol Swain. Both professors Sowell and Swain grew up in poverty in black communities. They advocate <clears throat> for an education in line with American liberal values and personal responsibility, which is what Martin Luther King Jr. advocated for. Our country should be a place where people are not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This is very different from current forms of diversity and equity training, where according to the color of your skin, you are deemed an oppressor or someone who is oppressed. This does nothing more than create white guilt and shame for those with white skin and a mentality of victimhood for people of color, where both groups are taught that our country is deeply and irredeemably racist. Let's not have diversity training that teaches students to view everything through only one lens, the lens of race. Instead, I advocate for a rigorous education that requires students to examine all sides of an issue. This type of training is available from the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism or FAIR. We shouldn't teach our students what to think. Instead, we should teach them how to think for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have Matt Chang with uh, Laura uh, Ainsworth on deck. 
Matt. Thank you, Chair Huntsman and members of the board for this opportunity to speak. My name is Max Chang and I'm speaking strictly as an individual today. It has come to my attention that the Utah State Board of Education has instructed its Department of Educational Equity to no longer provide equity, diversity, and inclusion training until further notice from the board. As this decision was made without public discussion by the board, I wish to express my concerns regarding its lack of transparency and ramifications on Utah students. Muhammad Ali once stated that, a man who views the world the same at 50 as he did at 20 has wasted 30 years of his life. The same can be said of schools and school boards. More than 30 years ago, as co-editor of the Skyline High School Horizon, we were pressured by school administrators and the PTA to not to publish a planned special edition on racism. Their arguments focused on that racism does not exist in our Utah community. We were able to eventually publish the edition with the help of our teacher, Claran Jacobs. And we went on to actually be nationally recognized. Today, some members of the USBE board still insist systemic racism does not exist and a push for a colorblind system and neutral curriculum. Yet these very notions propagated by a fiduciary body are exactly representative of systemic racism. Fear mongering claims that equity, diversity and inclusion training is out to indoctrinate students is poorly rooted on a slippery slope fallacy. If anything, a rich and diverse student population is being indoctrinated into narrowly defined parameters that only set us back from our collective goal of educational equity for all students. This is evidenced by some of the proposed language in draft two of R277-328, which treats diversity, equity, and inclusion as divisive rather than the unifying words that they are. The Utah State of Board of Education has both a legal and ethical responsibility to support the existing equity, diversity, and inclusion needs in the state. And I respectfully call upon you to immediately reverse this decision as to not to waste the past and next 30 years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have Laura Ainsworth with Linda Nielsen on deck. Laura, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, we can hear you. Um, there is a new bully in town that is threatening the mental health of children in public schools in some states that we should tr be trying to keep out of schools in Utah for the protection and well being of our children. Like all bullies, this new bully, disguised as equity training, creates fear, social anxiety, embarrassment, guilt, inadequacy, and sorrow in some children, and some is too many. Some students are being taught the false and flawed 1619 project, which was debunked by academics. The National Association of Scholars has requested that the Pulitzer Prize be withdrawn from its author due to the magnitude of its historical inaccuracies. In Cupertino, California, an elementary school forced first graders to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities and rank themselves according to their power and privilege. This is in the first grade. In Springfield, Missouri, a middle school forced teachers to locate themselves on an oppression matrix based on the idea that straight, white, English-speaking Christian males are members of the oppressor class and must atone for their privilege and covert white supremacy. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, an elementary school forced fifth graders to celebrate black communism and simulate a black power rally to free 1960s radical Angela Davis from prison where she had once been held on charges of murder. In Seattle, Washington, the school district told white teachers that they are guilty of spirit murder against black children and must quote, bankrupt their privilege in acknowledgement of their thieved inheritance. Call it equity training or diversity and inclusion, culturally responsive teaching or social justice. These euphemisms all sound good but they are meant to divide and shame factions of our society. Equity training is not equality training. Equality training is what school teachers have been teaching since the writing of our US constitution, that all men are created equal and are endowed with certain inalienable rights. 
Dear board yes. members, if you are thinking of adopting one of these equity training programs, I beseech you to reconsider as they are cruel to children. School districts will have to hire additional school psychologists to keep up with the load of helping children who have been harmed because a group of disgruntled theorists are unable to forgive the sins and crimes of past generations. As that time, as advocates for children, we should take a protective stance and keep this bullying at bay. The children in your schools bear no responsibility for the angst of those who want to keep racism at the forefront of all thought. Equity training is dishonest, divisive, and delusional. Let's work toward collaboration, cooperation, and unity. Thank you for your time. Um, next, we'll have Linda Nielsen with Tony Zanni on deck. Linda. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. 40 plus years ago, I heard an interview with a young black man by the name of Thomas Sowell. I'd never heard of him. I was blown away by his intellect and his message. I went out and purchased his book, Race and Culture, the next day. I commend it to all of you. He had started out as an angry Marxist and set out to prove that our country was hopelessly racist. He spent 10 years traveling the world attempting to demonstrate the unfairness that had taken place in America. Instead, he discovered things which completely changed his worldview, namely that nearly all civilized countries had experienced slavery at some point in their history. He realized that our constitution and its amendments had done more than any other country to right the wrongs of slavery. The problem with the proposed curriculum of revisionist history like CRT, with its erroneous and selective view of our history lacking context, is that it divides by skin color, creates loathing for our country, and perpetuates victimhood. How about we teach our kids real American history? How about we tell them that an earlier draft of the Declaration of Independence included a scathing rebuke of slavery, context, it was not included in the document because the Southern colonies would have withdrawn their support for the war against Great Britain. It took a subsequent bloody civil war resulting in the deaths of over 360,000 Union soldiers, most of whom were white, to win freedom for all Americans that our founders envisioned. That's the truth. Our founding fathers were great and courageous men and their stories need to be taught in proper context. We are a compassionate and caring nation. America has lifted so many, defended so many around the world, and has welcomed so many. Is it any wonder that thousands upon thousands of people will risk everything to, to come to America? Let's teach our kids real American history in context, instead of the convoluted, dishonest revision of history, which has already led to riots, murders, destruction, and a generation of purposefully misinformed victims. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have Tony Zani and then Greg Marchant, you're on deck. Tony, are you with us? Yeah, hi, my name is Tony Zani. I'm a literacy specialist here in Salt Lake City Schools and a national board certified teacher. Uh, I'll give you a change of pace on today's topic. So we're all very familiar now with the letters CRT. I want to make you familiar with the letters NBCT, National Board Certified Teacher. Uh, there are so few of us in the state of Utah because it's a very rigorous process. And we have 16 teachers this year that earned or renewed their NBCT during a pandemic in the year of 2020, and I want to congratulate them. I want to thank you, the board, and Superintendent Dixon for your support of National Board Certification. Board members, if you don't know, it is a rigorous process of recording your teaching and analyzing your practice. It is all focused on reflecting on what students need and what we as teachers need to do and learn in order to improve outcomes for students. Students with a National Board Certified Teacher get the equivalent of two more months of instruction in a school year. That's amazing. And this is amplified in high need schools like our Title I and rural schools. Teachers that go through the National Board Certification process are far more likely to stay in teaching. So this reduces teacher turnover, which is a major concern, again, especially in our high need schools. Um, National Board Certification was the best thing I ever did for my practice not so much for me as the kids I work with, because it made me reflect on what I do and to think, what do I need to do or change or learn 
so that my students have the best possible outcomes. So in my opinion, supporting national board certification is one of the best things that you as the board can do. Um, I again, congratulate all of the teachers that earned or renewed their national board during a pandemic year. And I look forward to when we can meet in person and have some pins placed on our new national board certified teachers in person. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we'll have Greg Marchant with Janet Ehring um, here on deck. Hi, I, we have four kids in Murray schools. They have great friends from different backgrounds. Due to time constraints here, I emailed a more detailed description of how parents' rights have been trampled, including a secretly formed equity council, critical race theory trainings, and book bundles infusing transgender ideology into third grade, and Ibram Kendi's critical race theory into kindergarten, telling five-year-olds to confess their racism, all without parental consent or input. Bewildered, we formed a parents' rights council with 75 parents and counting, None want to be outspoken advocates, but these events were the tipping point. Observed teacher training propaganda includes young, young minorities are so emotionally distraught by three concurrent pandemics, COVID, racial bias, and climate change, they need space to focus on social well being, not academics. Grading systems must be revamped to account for student inequalities. Gender is a social construct, all binaries must be unlearned. COVID is the gateway to radically change our educational system to overcome systemic racism and white supremacy. Equity isn't about equality. Educators should study and implement books on CRT such as White Fragility and How to Be an Anti-Racist. Parents' concerns have been dismissed, but now I'm learning why. Last week, I watched your diversity director explain CRT to this group using the same racist, divisive, and counterproductive pro propaganda. Did you, in, did you ignite the dumpster fire raging in our district? Will you fan the flames or will you put it out? These toxic philosophies will never end racism or cultivate kindness. Hyperfixation on race perpetuates division. Assigning races into oppressor and oppressed categories undermines relationships and wrongly judges people based on skin color, not character content. CRT fosters victimhood and rejects virtues essential for individual development and a prosperous society, such as equality, gratitude, and hard work. This dangerous road is a dead end. Train teachers to expect and demand the same high standards of all students with love and not bias. Teach respect, academic excellence, and accountability. Put plainly, lowering expectations or making generalized assumptions based on race is racism. Um, thank you. Next, we'll have Janet uh, airing with April Despain on deck. And I, just a shout out to Laurel Pitzer. I think your video is still on. Sometimes when somebody's moving about the room and that, they might like that reminder. <laughs> so I apologize for the, the shout out there. Um, Janet, are you ready to join us? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Jan Iring, a tenured professor for 27 years at Cal State Fullerton. I've taught and trained ESL students and teachers for the past 40 years. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. I've spoken before, but I will continue to speak until I'm certain that equity anti-bias training in Utah does not resemble critical race theory that is currently taking over California schools. At last month's public comment period, I listened while 16 people defended critical race theory training, parading as equity anti-bias training. After the meeting, I wrote a letter of complaint and did hear from a couple of board members for which I'm grateful. They told me that other viewpoints have also been shared at other meetings. And Cindy Davis sent me information about two documents the board had approved, which showed me the board is focused on providing a high quality education for all students. But it is to the other document that Cindy Davis shared, the recommendation of the Access Committee to the Standards and Assessment Committee, that I'd like to turn. This committee gives recommendations to the board for underrepresented students with whom I am familiar. The preface of this memorandum is filled with obvious critical race theory jargon, showing an incorrect premise to their suggestions. For example, the reference to racialized and xenophobic public discourse with no reference to who and what proportion this happens in Utah is incomplete. 
the reference to the systematic killing of unarmed black citizens by police is also unproven. The elevation of Black Lives Matter protests without mention of the accompanying violence and destruction that ensued during these protests and the counter protests for all lives matter was ignored. Also the reference to new world or in other words, the new world order is a reference to a radical left goal that is not widely shared in Utah by whites or people of color. The reference to the overrepresentation in behavioral referrals and underrepresentation in advanced classes suggests a racial component which is not supported in fact in the document. Finally, the reference to the social justice warrior scholarship on lived experience as the most legitimate data runs counter to the beliefs of most families in this state who trust empirical evidence of the Western scientific method. Now back to my main point, do these educators understand and respect the background and context of all of their students, no matter the color? For me as an educator, that is the first step in planning relevant and effective instruction. It should not be encased in political dogma that overgeneralizes about one racial group, encourage bullying of white people, encourages hostility towards history and tradition, and is dismissive of patriarch patriarchy and capitalism. That's the critical time. race theory religion attempts to do all of this and is not appropriate for Utah. And I will uh, vote for board members in the future if they are against critical race theory. And if I had my preference, I'd call for Governor Cox to entirely ban critical race theory in Utah, just as the state of Idaho has done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from April Despain and then Heidi Matthews, you're on deck. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. My name is April D. Spain. As a parent of five children in Murray District, I would like to speak out against teacher trainings on equity. Murray's issue began in fall 2020 when our school debuted the Equity Book Bundles program. As a trusting parent, I assumed good intent by our principals, though I wondered if the program might have left leanings. I felt that even if we had different personal views, the staff at my children's school would be respectful to, my family, to our family boundaries and to Utah law and not intentionally teach my children political doctrines or sexuality topics. I was sadly mistaken. In January this year, I learned my third grader in his class had been taught not only the meaning of transgender, but how to change their gender by taking medication. Since parents had, re had received no prior notice for this sensitive discussion, I was shocked. There are strict rules about teaching the basic maturation program to fifth graders, but suddenly in the name of equity, third graders can now be taught how to change their gender without even giving parents notice. In addition to sexuality, the equity program included critical race theory. The book Anti-Racist Baby by Ibram Kendi was a lesson for my kindergartner. It contains images of the Black Lives Matter political organization, as well as images of people demonstrating at political rallies. It tells my five-year-old to confess being racist, despite the fact that she is kind and accepting to children of all colors. It teaches that there is no neutrality between being racist or anti-racist. In other words, she must either accept critical race theory or consider herself racist. There is no other option and no allowance for questioning. This is the definition of indoctrination and it is absolutely inappropriate in our schools. My children go to school to learn to read and write, to study science and math, to practice being responsible and to value working hard so they can achieve academic excellence. This is what schools are for. These are the topics teachers should be trained on. Equity wants to make my children into political activists for identity politics. It tells my children to see themselves as racists who need to confess and repent for a sin they never committed. Why are our teachers being trained on divisive political topics? Please focus on academics and do not further this indoctrination. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our concluding Public comment is Heidi Matthews. Thank you, good morning. I'm Heidi Matthews, teacher serving as the president of the Utah Education Association organization that exists to fulfill the promise of public education for all of our students. First, I wanna share that the yearly NEA rankings and estimates are out and the tides are turning for public education in Utah. While we still have the distinction of the highest class sizes in the nation, we are no longer last in the nation for per pupil funding. We have passed Idaho, yes. 
In fact, between 2019 and 2020, U Utah's growth in per student funding is the eighth highest in the nation. And even more incredible is that the increase in average teacher salaries in Utah is ranked fourth in the nation. And that is what we call progress. It's thanks to our legislators, it's thanks to you and your leaders in the office and our educators and our Utah Education Association who represents them. And speaking of representation, our UEA is committed to serving as the educational stakeholder voice and so appreciate the opportunity to be specifically included per the directives of the American Rescue Act. The ARP fund will allow us to make enormous differences in, our, in the recovery in our schools, communities, and, and staff. And, um, and I just, all who've been so impacted by the pandemic. And I would like to reiterate our specific request that these federal funds get to our districts with as much local authority and control as possible and with as much flexibility as possible. Finally, on behalf of the over 18,000 educators in Utah or members of the UEA, let me express my gratitude for those of you who would who have expressed your gratitude in this National Teacher Appreciation Week. As champions for our students, we believe in the quality of being fair, free from bias or favoritism, which is the definition of equity. Please know that your sentiments and actions supporting us bolster us so that we can be the best for our students. And for some who still have confusion or misinformation about what happens in our classrooms, I would encourage you to visit our educators in our schools to get that cleared up. I especially uh, would like for you to, to meet with our local association leaders who have stepped up and please don't hesitate if we can be any assistance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this concludes our public comments. And again, there's an invitation to all that you can submit public comments in, in writing.